Today I have a what we call a talk, but I'm going to be referring to it as a session. Uh, I'm trying to make it as interactive as possible in the current climate. Um, and I'm also trying to make it a little bit fun. So there's going to be some stories, there's going to be some recommendations or some advice based on my own experience and some of the experience of others in the security space. Um, but it's really about this journey. It's a you know journey from uh, going from nothing, I have no security, or maybe I don't even have a company yet, to enterprise grade security and you know some of the mistakes that we can make along the way um, and how to avoid those mistakes. Uh, as Christian said, uh, my name is Seth. Uh, you can find me on the internet at, at Seth Vargo pretty much anywhere. Um, I work on the developer relations team at Google. Um, and like I said, um, when I was coming up with like this session, I was kind of struggling like what to call it, what to name it. Um, I actually had a few alternative titles for this session. Uh, the first was Essentials of Risk Management, um, but that felt like a title that you would use at an enterprise conference where you pay like $2,500 for a ticket to, to listen to some guy in a suit or some girl in a suit tell you uh, a bunch of stuff that you already know. And then I said, well, what if we swing the other direction and we say, well, let's talk about secure code development. But uh, as we all know, the most secure code is, is no code at all. Uh, so that would have been a, a very short talk. Um, and then one of my final options was like, uh, you're probably doing security all wrong. Uh, it was mostly just the screenshot. That was the entire talk. Um, but that felt a little bit too pointed. So instead we went with embarking on your security journey and again i'm trying to make this as much of a journey as possible um so if you have a question or if you want to interject like unmute yourself if you feel comfortable doing so and feel free to jump in uh, and with that let's travel back in time uh if we go back in time to you know the very early 2000s late 1990s back whenever dreamweaver was still owned by macromedia uh i was building websites i was primarily building websites using uh, Microsoft Front Page and Macromedia Dreamweaver, later Adobe Dreamweaver. Um, my day consisted of visitor counters and marquee tags, right? That was the, the 90s web at its finest. And one of the things that's you know most interesting and, and still sits with me today about that experience is I configured my IDE, uh, Dreamweaver or Front Page, such that when I clicked save, it automatically FTP'd my changes directly to production. Uh, it wasn't even SFTP. I just saved the file and like, boom, it was right in front of my customers. Um, you know, all three people that visited my website that year. Um, there was no CID, there was no CI, there was no CD, there was no code review. And honestly, who even needs source control if you have RAID 5 and control Z? And obviously there's a lot of risks with this approach. Uh, and we've moved away from saving files directly onto production servers over FTP connections, I hope. But there was a lot of value in this workflow, right? The, the fact that I could make a change locally on my laptop and then have it available in production very quickly was of extreme value uh, in my feedback loop. And when we think about the security space, the DevOps space today, we sometimes lose sight of that, right? Oh, well, it's going to take six days to get this code into production. It's going to take two weeks to get this code in production. And one of the kind of overarching themes of this talk is like, how can we bring in the complexity that modern software development requires, whether that's you know site reliability engineering and uptime or security or UX and UI design? How can we get as close to that 1990s experience of saving a file and having it immediately available in production while still checking all the boxes and meeting all the requirements for modern software development. And you might ask yourself, like, why do these modern software uh, requirements even exist? It seems stupid. Um, well, it's because ultimately, you know, a project has to become a product and a hobby has to become a business. Um, otherwise, you, you can't continue to invest and grow the project or the hobby into something meaningful and profitable. So let's start on our journey. So it's the 90s, we have our marquee tags and visitor counters, and we're building a business. And let's say we're building um, 
the world's first online bank. So we're going to be partnering with credit card processors and financial institutions to take money from people digitally in exchange for goods and services. Um, and you individually uh, are my new security engineer. Um, we have just hired you uh, fresh from the job board. Uh, and you know you have a little bit of background in security and I am the co-founder or the founder of this company uh, and I have a task for you. Um, and the first task is, you know, I built this application already. Um, it is written in some language. It's not really relevant here. Um, but we're about to launch for the first time and I need you to do a security review. I know we just hired you, but can you do a security review? Uh, do you agree? Great. You all agree. Um, at least your, your faces that are this big, you all agree. Um, if you don't agree, you're fired. So, uh, Hopefully you agree. So let me let me go get the application real fast. I'll be right back. So uh, I have the application here. Uh, it's a few pages. Um, I don't know. It looks like it's maybe about twenty pages, eight and a half by eleven. If you could just put your address, um, uh, you can email it to me. Um, I'll I'll send you a copy of the application. And then it's very important that you only use red ink whenever you mark up this application. So red ink, and then email me your address and I'll, I'll get you a copy of the code. Um, and it's double-sided, so make sure you, you check both sides. Now, this brings up a very important concept that might seem rudimentary to some, uh, but I work with a lot of customers. Uh, version control is actually very important and frankly a requirement if you're trying to practice good security. Uh, one. Uh, it enables us to collaborate. Uh, it, it's not feasible for me to ship around printed out code uh, to various offices and locations around the world so that you can quote, review that code and then send it back to me. Not only is that time consuming and our competitors are going to eat us for lunch, but it's also very risky um, because what if you lose it? What if the postal service loses it? What if it gets uh, you know, lost uh, or stolen? Um, so there's a lot of challenges with this and it's very important that we have version control, not just for the collaborative aspect, but also from an integrity perspective. Because our business is in a regulated industry, we're working in financial services, we may be asked by our auditors to produce a compliance report and we may need to prove that only certain people had access to the code or the code went through certain requirements or check boxes um, to pass some certification. And without source control, we really can't make that those same guarantees. So this might be a review for some, but if you're not familiar, version control keeps track of all of the changes in your system in a very centralized way. It provides a single source of truth and it also enables things like collaboration, auditability, et cetera. And then there's a number of like popular tools and technologies that are built on top of the VCS paradigm like GitLab and GitHub that also enable like contributor workflows and you know various ACLs and permission-based systems. And you can also build a community around a uh, version control system. We often call this like open source, but that's separate from just keeping your files in version control. So, Let's suppose that we've solved this problem. We now have version control. Remember, it's like the late 90s, early 2000s. So it's SVN, it's not Git, but we'll deal with it, right? So we have our system in SVN and we're able to collaborate um, and it is in the middle of a pandemic, right? So we're all distributed, we're not in a physical office. So the fact that we you know, can leverage the centralized source control system and we can check out our code and make changes across time zones and we have a history and an auditing trail, very, very good. Um, but now you've told you know, the, um, the previous security engineer that I hired, it didn't work out. Um, uh, she said that there was just too much work and that I didn't know what I was talking about. But the previous security engineer said that I needed to use better crypto. Not really sure what she meant by that. And it's been a while since we've had a security engineer. So I just asked on Stack Overflow. As you know, that's you know where the internet exists. Uh, all the answers to everything technical on the internet exist on Stack Overflow. So. I was trying to figure out what she meant by the best crypto. Um, so I asked, I said, you know, hey, my security team has this policy that I need to use the best crypto. Could somebody please help? I don't know what to use. Uh, and then for a little more context, like the applications written in Java and it processes credit cards for a global bank. Um, and, you know, some of the answers were what you would expect. Most people said I should use the blockchain. 
Um, but we got uh, some really detailed responses too. Um, and in fact, this was the, the best response we got. Um, the, uh, the poster said that, uh, you know, make sure that we use the most secure flags for Java, um, make sure that we're using MD5 over SHA-512, make sure we're using really small keys and certain algorithms, because uh, smaller keys are harder to find. If you have a, a big key, you can spot it from across the room, but a small key, right, you're not going to be able to find it. Um, and, you know, this was really helpful. And <clears throat> honestly, like the best part of this whole experience is, uh, this particular user was so humble that they, you know, they didn't even claim credit for their work. Uh, they just came out as anonymous. Now, I feel obligated to break character here for a moment and tell you that you should not do any of this. Um, obviously, this is this is fake. Uh, you should never disable SSL uh, revocation checks. You should really not use MD5 anymore. Um, it's been considered broken. Uh, you should not use DES or triple DES, also considered broken. And you should use, you know, a reasonable length key, um, like 256 or, or 512 bit, um, uh, your 1024 or 2048 um, are, are, you know, much, much better or even better use like ECDSA keys or EDDSA keys. Anyway, my point is that all too often we uh, force our developers or engineers to make security decisions and they may not have a background or um, the ability to get the correct answers to their information. And worse, this is an exaggeration, but advice like this does exist on the internet. It exists on Stack Overflow, it exists in blog posts. Uh, in a previous life, I did a lot of development with Ruby and Rails. And for a good 10 years, um, if you Googled any error message related to like failed to verify SSL certificate, everyone's response was just to disable SSL revocation or SSL um, CA verification and validation. And this was like a terrible idea, but the community had rallied around the idea that we didn't need to, to check CAs. And it took a really long time for the Ruby community to unlearn that behavior, even though it was a really bad security practice. And this leads us to our next point, which is if we want developers and engineers to take security seriously, we have to make it easy and we have to make it codified. If security is hard, people will skip it or they'll do it incorrectly. Um, and it, it doesn't mean that they're a bad actor, right? It doesn't mean that they're doing it intentionally, but in general, developers are not rewarded for following security practices. And we have an entire practitioner line of people who specialize in security. So it's actually unrealistic to expect a developer to be able to know all of the things about security. Instead, we need to build frameworks and tools as security professionals that enable developers and engineers to kind of color inside of the lines. To draw a real world analogy, if you drive an automobile, like a car or a truck, an SUV, the vast majority of people only interact with a few interfaces of that vehicle. You interact with the steering wheel, you interact with the, the shifter, if it's a, you know, a standard or the, the gear shift, if it's an automatic, uh, you may interact with like the radio or perhaps a touchscreen, uh, headlights, um, you may interact with a turn signal unless you're in the new Tesla, which doesn't have turn signals somehow. But my point is that that's a very small subset of the actual interfaces that a vehicle has. Now, there's also other people like auto mechanics who are deeply invested in learning about all of the possible interfaces and connectivity that that vehicle has to offer, whether that's the engine, the transmission, the battery, the oil, right? All of these are interfaces that the average driver or the average user of an automobile doesn't need to concern themselves with. You might, right? You might be a hobbyist and you might play with it on your side, but it's not a requirement in order to use a car. We have to think about security the same way. If we're building an application, <clears throat> there's a lot of Legos and properties that our system needs to have in order for it to be secure. But we shouldn't require our developers to build their own Legos. We shouldn't require them to assemble their own engine to drive the car. So in this way, proper security is a lot like the car. Only the mechanics or security engineers need to understand 
the security of the entire system. Our engineers really just need a steering wheel, a shifter, and some gas pedals. And they need to know that if they use just the steering wheel, just the shifter, and just the gas pedals, that their system is secure by design. So let's say we've solved this problem. We've, uh, we've invested our, um, some engineering resources in UI and UX and some DevX into building an amazing security framework and a set of security tooling that all of our developers can use. We have version control. We have all these new tools and technologies. Um, but I still have these 34,188 34, lines of code that are not through security review, right? It's legacy code. Uh, it's, the, it's the code I was going to mail you earlier. Um, it still hasn't been reviewed. So could you please review it? We're waiting. OK, um, well, here's what I don't understand. Like, we invested in all of this stuff, but you're still telling me that you need time to review this code. I thought we like fixed all of this. But you're saying it's legacy code and it's not in the framework, so it's still going to take a bunch of time. I understand. Um, how much time? OK, uh, six weeks. That's, um, that's really going to put a damper on our, our timelines. So this brings us to our next point, which is that <clears throat> we have to invest in automation to scale. Um, and, and we'll talk about a point here in a little bit, which is scale sublinear with stakeholders. But there are a number of things in the security field which are very easy to automate that also tend to take up a lot of time from the humans that do security review and analysis. Humans make mistakes, and we can reduce the rate and the cost of those mistakes by codifying security best practices and common feedback from security reviews. This may include things like automated static analysis, vulnerability scanning, or even fuzzing. But oftentimes we make mistakes where we, we hire brilliant people focused on you know, security or UI or UX, and we just end up turning them to a broken record where they keep repeating the same thing over and over again. And at Google, you know, we kind of have this underlying paradigm that you should automate yourself out of last year's job. And that's true across kind of all facets of the organization, including security. So <clears throat> if you spent an entire year telling people, don't do this or don't do that, a much better investment of your time would have been building a tool that automatically detects that, whether it's you know, something sophisticated like a static analyzer or something less sophisticated like a really good regular expression. So that developers get that feedback directly and so that you can think about higher, higher level problems. To put it another way, um, best practices belong in code, not in wikis or um, kind of like folklore, if you will, word of mouth. Uh, and that code could be in the framework, it could be in CI CD, or it could be in a linter, but it belongs in something that is automatable. So let's say we fix this. We now have automated everything. Um, and all of our new products use the security framework so that everything is great, but we still have this original product, our core product, the one that I was going to mail you earlier in, the, in this session, um, and it needs security review. <clears throat> so we finally invested in all of this automation, and we're going to run it on the application. So I'm giving you the application, and you are going to run these scanners. About two weeks later, um, because you have a backlog, you get around to running the scanner. The scanner only takes about a half hour to finish, and it finds 18 vulnerabilities. Not a big deal. Some of them are low severity and might not be relevant, but you also uncovered a critical design flaw that reduces the entire security of the system. And that's going to require a pretty significant refactor. So you have to break the news to me uh, that not only are there some vulnerabilities, which not a big deal, maybe two weeks of engineering time to fix, but there's a critical vulnerability in like the fundamental design of this system, right? Not at a, not at a code level, right? It's not like you have a null pointer exception or a, a stack overflow, right? This is like architecturally something is wrong with the system. And because of that, this project, which we were supposed to launch 12 weeks ago is now delayed over a year because we have to refactor and redesign everything. And this is where you get into a difficult relationship culturally between the development teams and the security organization, because these types of experiences over time lead to a not so great relationship. 
between the development teams and the security engineering teams. <clears throat> because of this, it's important that security participates early and often. And security is not a place where dreams go to die, or it should not be a place where dreams go to die. Um, that's legal, different department. Security isn't where the dreams go to die. And, and you have to really remember that they ultimately have the company's best interests at heart. And instead of security being viewed as this like services organization of a bunch of yes, no check boxes, it really needs to be viewed as a partnership organization for teaching development teams best practices and helping them build the most secure code so that the business is not put at risk. Members of the security team need to be involved at the project's onset. Uh, or a features onset, whether that's system design, regular code review, deployments, and rollback strategies, right? Design documents. Um, the security team should be approving designs and approving security properties of the system regularly, which helps reduce the feedback loop. And the only way that you're going to be able to do this is if you also do the things that we talked about earlier, like investing in automation. Because if you don't invest in automation, you're going to spend all of your time reviewing every line of code instead of zooming out and looking at the larger picture, like the architecture of the system. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, this sounds great for a small organization, but what, what happens when this company grows? <clears throat> We're going to have 75 software teams and just a few security engineers. How are our small team of security engineers going to support all of these various software teams and stakeholders? We can't hire a new security engineer for every new project or every new software engineer that we hire. And you're right. <clears throat> and another key point on our security journey is that our teams have to scale sublinearly with their stakeholders. At Google, a large part of our success is really due to our ability to scale. You hear a lot about this in the SRE program where you know, we only have a few thousand SREs that support products that are used by billions of users every day. Our security team isn't much different from that. We only have a handful of security experts internally at Google that service a number of our software teams. So just like SRE is serving stakeholders as end users, our security team is serving software developers as end users. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So earlier we invested in automating many of the processes and scans and code reviews that were previously manual, but we still relied on someone from the security team to execute the tools to report on the results. This led to a bottleneck. Even though we had automated everything, we're still relying on our security team to click the button and interpret the results. Instead, we need to bring security tools into the hands of our developers, whether that's through our CICD pipeline or technologies that they can run locally on their local laptop. We do this in the same way that developers run unit tests or functional tests. This way, and as we know from the state of DevOps and a number of other independent research reports, that the sooner that we find a bug or a vulnerability, the less it costs the organization to fix, both monetarily, but also culturally. I don't know how many of you have ever had someone come back to you six months after you wrote some code and said, hey, there's a bug here. It's really jarring emotionally and physically sometimes to have to reload all of that context and, you know, did I make a mistake? What's wrong here? Versus when I'm in the zone and I'm in the moment and it's on my local laptop, if I get an alert that says, hey, you're using an outdated version of some library or, hey, you have a null pointer exception here, I can fix it very quickly with minimal overhead. So let's say we do that, right? Let's say we give our developers all of the security tools. Um, they run them locally on their laptop, or maybe we have some licensing requirements that uh, it has to run in like a central CI system because uh, you know, we only have a few licenses. But either way, we have this all set up and it's working great. Developer have, have total control over their CACD pipeline, whether that's their unit tests or functional tests or their security tests. You might be thinking to yourself though, if you remove the security team from the loop, if they're only involved in that initial design phase, and then you give all the tools and technologies to the development team, how do you prevent the development team from just circumventing the security checks? How do you ensure that the security checks were actually followed? How do you make sure that the security scanner actually ran? Well, <clears throat> this is where we get a little bit more technical. And, and I think this is where 
um, a lot of organizations are, are currently blocked in their security journeys is they're not willing to empower developers because they're worried about that loss of control from the centralized security organization. One of the ways that we can still exert that control while scaling sublinearly and providing the same um, risk mitigations is by leveraging cryptographic signatures. When we remove the direct human element, we run the risk that teams can circumvent the security process. As a result, we need our security tools to sign our application bundles, and then our production systems check that those signatures exist on the bundle. So if we take a concrete example, let's say I have a security scanning software like Forseti, and it runs on my CICD pipeline. <clears throat> I have an asymmetric key pair, a public key and a private key. My Forseti system has access to the private key. And when it runs, assuming it finds you know, some threshold of no vulnerabilities, it uses its private key to sign the checksum or the, the actual application binary uh, or code that it ran against. Then our deployment system, maybe it's our container orchestrator like Kubernetes or our cloud provider or our on-premise system. Whenever a developer says, hey, deploy this code, or you know, if you're using Spinnaker or some deployment tool, when it says, hey, deploy this code, the production system is configured to require attestations from those signatures. And it's required, say, from the security tool. So whenever a binary is deployed or, or code is deployed to production, the production system itself goes and fetches the public key that it corresponds to the private key that signed the application bundle from the security tool. And it validates that the signature is truly valid and matches the code that's going to be deployed. If that succeeds, we can say with a very high degree of confidence that this code went through the proper security channels. And if it doesn't, it either means our CICD pipeline is misconfigured, or it means this particular developer is pushing these code changes or is trying to deploy this artifact, which has not undergone the security review, or it went through security review, but it did not pass because we would only add the attestation on a passing um, build. Now, <clears throat> you might be thinking, well, like, what if there's a legitimate reason that we need to get something out the door. Like we can't wait 30 minutes for our CACD pipeline to complete and the security scan to run. Um, we need to get a fix out right now. We're currently down, we're losing money. Um, and like even at Google, we, we have escape hatches for this. Um, you can add annotations and you can request access approvals to override these requirements. And at that point, the security mindset shifts from prevention to auditing and detection. If there's truly a legitimate reason why you need to bypass security scanning for a particular deployment, you can do so. It's going to set off a number of alarm bells. It's going to create some audit trails. It's going to alert your management chain that this action took place. And if that action is legitimate and you are acting in good faith, you know the audit is logged, it goes into a report and the world moves on. But if you're acting nefariously or if you're a bad actor in the system, your whole management chain is going to find out and you're at risk of you know, losing your job. Um, and, and this really provides like a nice segue into my next point and probably the biggest mistake that I see security organizations and companies in general make is they believe that security is binary, <clears throat> um, ones and zeros. It's a yes, no. Um, and this is because there's a lot of checklists, frameworks and automation that make us think that things are either pass fail. But in reality, security is like a little bit more of a gradient where the required security of a system is largely dependent on its threat model or its risk model. <clears throat> Disagreements are also going to happen and exceptions are going to occur. Teams are going to have requirements that fall outside of your organization's agreed upon security specifications. And frankly, that's okay. That's why we call security an engineering discipline as opposed to a program management discipline, because we are going to be engineering tools and frameworks, but we cannot be afraid to have conversations. Things are going to break, paradigms are going to evolve, and that's why we have a dedicated security team that's focused on these higher level issues. So whenever a team or a, a developer says, you know, hey, I don't think this particular security check is relevant to me, there's a clear and defined path for them 
to go get an exception and have a conversation with the security team. A really good example, like even internally, is we had a team that was building an application that intentionally had security vulnerabilities in it to teach people about security vulnerabilities. That's a very real use case of why you might want to build some security vulnerabilities into a product. But it obviously flagged every scanner in the world. And all it needed was an exception and a conversation about how we're going to make sure that that application never had access to user data, ran on completely segmented infrastructure, um, and you know how we were going to monitor to make sure that it itself was contained in a sandbox because we expected people to break the security of the system. <clears throat> and that brings us to our last point, which is security and really any industry is constantly evolving and we have to be willing to embrace our mistakes as learning opportunities. And I'll end with a very quick story. Internally at Google, we have a, a shared password management system that allows us to share passwords where we don't have federated identity. And a few years ago, we had a major outage in the system. I won't go into too much detail, but the system's multi-tenant and there's various encryption keys that are stored in memory. And so long as one instance is up and running, um, we can continue to operate and bring new instances online. However, when the entire system crashes, in order to restore it, you need to input a recovery key because the encryption key is only ever stored in memory. Well, that's good. All the data is encrypted and the keys are in memory and you know, we have this slightly scalable solution. But when the entire system went down, we had to bring it back up. <clears throat> so we needed the recovery key. Well, the recovery key was printed on a physical piece of paper or <clears throat> I believe it was on a thumb drive. But, <clears throat> um, and, and that thumb drive was put in a physical safe. Um, and that, that physical safe had a combination and that combination was in the password manager that was currently inaccessible because it was down. Um, and in the wonderful game of rock, paper, scissors, crowbar beats safe, um, in case you were curious. So long story short, we had a backup plan but we literally had to break into a safe with a crowbar and a hammer in order to get out a recovery key because we didn't recognize that we had a circular dependency. The backup plan wasn't tested and an untested backup isn't a backup at all. And my point in telling you this is, one, it's a really funny story. Um, two, even Google makes mistakes. But three, the outcome of this was, um, um, an intense learning opportunity for Google where we had to think about, you know, how do we mitigate this situation? And even, um, you know, you can read about this a lot more. We, we've talked about this particular incident publicly in uh, this white paper, as well as the SRE books and the SRS book. Um, but, you know, this incident led to one of our overall programs. We have at Google called DIRT, which is disaster recovery and testing where we just shut off entire data centers or we disconnect our entire leadership team from the core of the business to make sure that we maintain continuity. And this is actually a security concern, right? This is going to identify bottlenecks in your system, some of which put your business at risk from a security perspective. So don't be afraid to break systems. There's a whole branch of engineering called chaos engineering that's, that's relatively new that is, is centered around this idea. And just remember that an untested backup or an untested strategy isn't a strategy at all. So to quickly summarize, at the very beginning of this session, I said that we were on a journey. I hope it wasn't too corny. Uh, we're all digital and doing our best to keep everyone involved. If there's one thing that you take away from this talk that's not on this slide, it's that security isn't a checkbox. It's a journey, much like this session, that encompasses multiple teams, technologies, and paradigms. It's an ever-moving target, and it's never done. <clears throat>